Welcome to this week's episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I am Andrew Seidel, the Director of Strategic Response here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Today we're going to be talking to two FFRFers, PJ Slinger and Reagan Lucy, about why they are atheists. A fitting topic for a show called Ask an Atheist. And if you've got questions, you can ask them right here in the comments on Facebook or send an email to askanatheist at FFRF.org. That's Ask an Atheist at FFRF.org. And we're going to get to those at the end of the show. But first, we need to talk about Christian nationalism. Again, Christian nationalism is the claim that America was founded as a Christian nation, that we are based on Judeo-Christian principles, and that we've strayed from that foundation. This is a political identity that is based on lies and myths. It's a permission structure that uses the language of return of getting back to our godly roots to justify all manner of hateful public policy and even attacks on our democracy. I have been saying for years that Christian nationalism is an existential threat to our republic. I wrote a book about that threat and the disinformation that feeds the Christian nationalist identity and the unwarranted privilege it assumes. I called it un-American. And on January 6th, I watched in horror as this wave of Christian nationalism broke over our capital, threatening the peaceful transfer of presidential power for the first time in American history. I have been deeply immersed in the investigation into this insurrection ever since. I'm working on a number of projects, including one for FFRF and a new epilogue for The Founding Myth, uh, which actually focuses just on January 6th and that terrorist attack. Every day, I learn more about how this identity, about how the Christian nationalist permission structure motivated the attackers. That Christian nationalism cuts across all the other motivations and the identities that we saw there that day. Uh, The white nationalism and even the absurd QAnon conspiracy. They believed that they were fighting for God's chosen one. And if God was on their side, who could be against them? We got the first airing of the January 6th attacks during Trump's second impeachment. But little, if anything, was said about the Christian nationalist aspect of the assault. I feared, and I still fear, that the January 6th Select Committee that held its first hearing yesterday was going to do the same thing. And when Representative Cheney used her opening statement to say that we are one nation under God, which is a Christian nationalist war cry, and very much a motivating ethos of that day, I was worried all over again. They were going to ignore or cover for Christian nationalism. But then the politicians listened to the testimony of four police officers, four officers who were on the front line that day. And they spoke about the violence that was inflicted upon them, the injuries they suffered, the number of times they were electrocuted, the attempts to gouge out their eyes and seize their guns, how they were dragged into the mob and beaten, the chemicals they were doused with, the surgeries that they have had to endure, the traumatic brain injuries they've suffered, the many colleagues who have resigned. One of their fellow officers took his own life. They spoke about their anger, their anger with the callousness, the cowardice, and the indifference of those who deny the seriousness of this assault. And many whose lives were saved by those very officers on that very day are doing the denying. They spoke about the odious racial slurs and racism they faced that day. And finally, one of them, Officer Hodges, who was the officer trapped and nearly crushed to death between the doors as the mob surged through the Capitol, spoke about the Christian nationalist aspect of this assault, though not quite in those terms. But let's take a look. It was clear the terrorists perceived themselves to be Christians. I saw the Christian flag directly to my front. Another read, Jesus is my savior, Trump is my president. Another, Jesus is king. Another shouted, do not attack us. We're not Black Lives Matter. As if political affiliation is how we determine when to use force. A man in a QAnon hoodie exclaims, this is the time to choose which side of history to be on. A man whose shirt read, God, guns, and Trump stood behind him, silently holding a Trump flag. God, guns, and Trump. Jesus is my savior. Trump is my president. 
the Christian flag. That Christian flag was carried into battle against America, against the police officers protecting the beating heart of our democracy. The terrorists didn't just parade the flag on the battle lines. They carried that Christian flag onto the floor of the U.S. Senate. They attacked, they conquered, and they paraded their flag on the vanquished ground. And then, and then they said a prayer Jesus to Jesus in that again. Senate. Amen. 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 Let's all say a prayer. Let's all say a prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. For this opportunity to stand up for our God-given unalienable rights. We love you and we thank you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. 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 In Christ's holy name we pray. We cannot understand what happened on January 6th without understanding Christian nationalism. Those officers demanded justice, accountability. They turned to this committee made up of representatives whose lives they saved and representing the democracy they saved, and they are asking for justice and accountability. And our country needs it. But we will only get that reckoning if we grapple with the role that Christian nationalism played in violently assaulting our democracy. Let's hope this select committee does not ignore, or worse, cover for Christian nationalism. Let's hope this select committee listens to Officer Hodges. Because on January 6th, Christian nationalism proved beyond all doubt that it is indeed un-American, and that it will not go gently into the obsolescence for which it is bound. If we refuse to identify and confront this threat, it will strike again. And the attackers made that clear. And if you didn't watch that hearing yesterday, or if you think this wasn't such a big deal, go and listen to those officers. Hear from their own lips what happened to them. And if they can't convince you that this is serious, willful blindness is your problem. We are going to be doing more here at FFRF on the role that Christian nationalism played in this insurrection in the coming days, so please stay tuned for that. And if you pre-order a copy of The Founding Myth on paperback, it has that brand new epilogue that is dealing solely with the January 6th insurrection. All right, so now I'm going to get down off my soapbox here, uh, and we are going to turn to something completely different, our planned show for the day. Uh, today I am joined by two of FFRF's talented staff, PJ and Reagan. PJ Slinger is the editor of Free Thought Today, FFRF's newspaper, that get, gets published 10 times a year. He has been with FFRF for nearly six years after coming off a 15-year stint as editor and writer at the Cap Times, the Capital Times newspaper here in Madison. Uh, and you met Annie Laurie back in tw 2013 yep. um, <clears throat> for the Capital Times, and that led to this job two years after that. Yeah, so... I, you know, I was always a big fan of FFRF, although not a member at the time, but Capital Times always got, <clears throat> excuse me, free thought today, and the, when the person who delivered the mail around the newsroom always brought that to me, just out of habit, because I was the only <laughs> one that actually liked to rifle through it. Um, so it, we all, every reporter had to come up with somebody to interview probably about once a month to go in the paper. And I was like, well, Annie Laurie, you know, I'll do her if, uh, if, they, if she allows it. And this just happened to coincide with the uh, upgrade to the building. So here, worked, at, Free, here at Free Thought Hall. Yes, here yeah. in Free Thought Hall. Yeah. Uh, so there was a good news angle to it. It wasn't just, here's Annie Laurie of FFRF. Sure. Um, so we talked, and I did the interview. And then afterwards, uh, I just mentioned how much I liked FFRF. And she's like, oh, you know, our... Our editor, Bill Dunn, is going to be retiring soon. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I would love that job, but uh, there were reasons I had to stay at the Cap Times for a few more years. Sure. Um, but then a couple of years after that, they offered another buyout, and it was an offer too good to refuse. So I left and had kind of completely forgot about the interview with Annie Laurie or what she had said. And so I'm, you know, sending out resumes and everything, and I got a call from Annie Laurie are you still interested? Right. <laughs> and I was like, whoa. <clears throat> so it's, I mean, it's nice. You have a nose for news and then a nose for who to interview for your yep. future job prospects. That's yep. fantastic. Uh, we are also joined today by Reagan Lucy. And Reagan is an FFRF legal intern. Uh, she is starting at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in just a few short weeks. Uh, Reagan entered into the secular world when she started a secular student alliance chapter in college 
and served in, on the National Leadership Council. Uh, SSA is just a great organization. We're going to get into that. She is also the Assistant State Director for our good friends at American Atheists and is looking forward to defending state church separation as a constitutional attorney after law school. And we're thrilled to have Reagan on staff as a legal intern. So, uh, Reagan, PJ, welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us on Ask an Atheist. Sure. And, Thanks for having us. Yeah, and thank you for suffering through my rant. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies for that. Uh, so this show is called Ask an Atheist. We often end up, though, you know, with a bunch of lawyers talking about legal issues or occasionally one ranting about Christian nationalism. Uh, but today we really wanted to focus on those personal stories about how people arrive at a blissful, godless life uh, that so many believers think is impossible. Uh, so we're going to hear from PJ and then from Reagan about how and why they are atheists. So PJ, tell us your story. Well, I never had the actual, you know, lightning bolt conversion type story. Mine was just... Conversion or deconversion? Uh, deconversion, I guess. <laughs> okay. uh, so I was raised Methodist. My parents went to church every Sunday, you know, religiously, you might mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I hated it. I just, I didn't get it. Um, when I got old enough, to help with the uh, like the nursery programs, so I didn't have to sit in the actual church and listen to the you know the sermon and whatever. I gladly took that, so I would just go in the nursery and help you know take care of the little kids, and that was so much better. It's better, it's better than sitting on those hard pews. Oh, it's so yeah. much better and listening to all that. Yeah. Um, but I had never. I don't know if I ever truly, truly believed. Maybe as a young kid, up to sometime in grade school. Um, but like, I think I believed in Santa Claus more than I actually believed in God because Santa had tangible assets, yeah. deliverables, yeah. you know? Yeah. God, not so much. Annu annual deliveries yep. that prove so, the existence. You yeah. know, there were pictures of him. There was stuff under the tree on December 25th. So, yeah. you know, hey, he's pretty real. God, not so much, potentially. And once I, you know, became of age to know that Santa and Tooth Fairy and Easter Bunny and all that wasn't real. It wasn't much of a step, you know, to be like, you know what? I think this God stuff isn't uh, all it's cracked up to be. Yeah. Apologies to any children watching who uh, did not Whoops. know. Whoops. Uh, we should have. I mean, I think <laughs> I think my rant probably cleared any spoiler alert that we needed to do. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, so then uh, I remember junior high. I was very skeptical. I don't know if. If I was an out-and-out -out atheist, I certainly didn't call myself that. I didn't even know. Were you, were you still involved in the church, though, as your skepticism oh, yeah. was growing? I, my parents would not allow me not to go to church okay. until I turned 18. Okay. And if you're, you're going to be in our house, you're going to be in our church. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Although the day I turned 18, from that day forward, I never stepped into a church willingly unless it was for a wedding or yeah. a funeral. And you, beyond volunteering with the, the, the nursery, you, you had some other important roles. In the oh, church. yes. Yep. I, 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 want, I have a painting that, I, I, not a picture. <laughs> this is a painting, ladies and gentlemen, that I would like to show. So uh, tell us what we're looking at here. Fourth and fifth graders were able to become acolytes, the ones who lit the candles before the service and distinguish, or extinguish them after the service. So you had to wear this religious robe and sit behind the pastor for the service. And, of course, my parents thought this was, you know, what a wonderful thing for our child to be doing. You know, we, we did a we did a, a show on John McNaughton, who's the, the artist who really likes to portray Trump as being touched oh, yeah. by God yep. and all that. And I was just reminded of that looking at that that painting. I feel like we could do a whole show <laughs> just on that. Put it back up, Bruce. I mean, like this looks to me like the fires of hell behind you in yep. the windows. It was very orange. Yep. Yeah, you know, and your your foot is not on anything. No, I well, I'm stepping down to uh, to head out. I, that must be. Except that only your foot is stepping down, and then the, it looks like the Last Supper is, yep. is behind you here yep. as well. Yeah, I mean, and then that shadow of the cross, and you get the double cross. This time yep. it's just it's very interesting. So, so who who painted this? Uh, Ray Maliza, who this was like a second. grade. Greater or uh, <laughs> no? <laughs> he was he was a member of the Methodist Church that we attended. Very rude. I apologize. And, uh, <laughs> I, I have a feeling he's probably not alive anymore. <laughs> Makes me feel. Uh, however, my parents apparently liked his his yeah. work and commissioned him to do this painting, uh, much to my chagrin and to my siblings' uh, utter uh, fantasy. 
So they were, I mean, they were very serious about you being in church. Yes. And, you know, one thing that always strikes me is that we often hear about how humans have this God-shaped hole in them that needs to be filled, right? That, that there's this vacuum that exists that only God and religion can fill. But it's just not true. You, you, have, to, you have to force kids to go to church and you're essentially creating this this hole in this, and you're forcing it upon them. If 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 there was that hole, people would do, do it willingly without threats of hell or uh, we're not going to kick you out of the house or whatever it was. You know? Yep. Yeah. I, I like I, I hated Sunday mornings. I just hated Sunday mornings. And even uh, there's a Simpsons episode from early where Lisa Simpson mm-hmm. gets back from church and she's like. Yay, it's the best time of the week. It's the longest time before we have to go to church again. <laughs> and I felt that. Like, that, that to me was exactly what it was. Like, okay, I don't have to go back to church for almost seven days now. And it was just such a relief. And was it worse for you being in Green Bay and being a huge Packers fan, knowing that a chunk of your Sunday was going to be spent in church? Well, church... Being in Green Bay, they they work church around the Packers. <laughs> of course they did. Otherwise, nobody would show up. Yep. So on um, home game Sundays, they had an earlier service, yeah. so people could still get to the games. Um, so that wasn't really ever an issue. Yeah, okay. Okay. That, I mean that that does that does make sense. If you're going <laughs> to ask people to choose in Green Bay to choose the Packers or church, it's not going to. Yep. Uh, yep. God's not going to win that one. <laughs> So you you finally you didn't have a, a, a the opposite of uh, uh, Paul's moments of conversion. Did you do you remember what were some of the first dominoes that started to fall for you aside from likening God to Santa Claus? Uh, it just it never made real sense to me. Like mm-hmm. you know, if you think about a lot of these stories, yeah, like Noah's Ark, it's just like that couldn't have happened. Like it's nearly impossible. And, you know, that's from somebody in middle school thinking that, yeah. you know. Um, so it wasn't probably until I got to college here at the University of Wisconsin where I just, I wanted to put everything to rest. Like, okay, I'm an atheist, but I just want to figure it out. So I took philosophy 101. Mm-hmm. And in the syllabus, it's like, yeah, we'll talk about proofs of God's existence. And I'm like, there we go. That's going to do it, you know. If those proofs are legitimate, yeah. I'll be swayed. Bring it on. And then they had the proofs, and they were ridiculous. It's like, these aren't <laughs> proofs. These are, th- you know, at best theories, you know. It's a lot of circular and argumentation. Not, yeah, not scientific theories, sure. you know, hypotheses, I guess. And at that point, I was like, okay, so if this is the best philosophers can come up with, it, it's a done deal. Yeah. They're, they're, it's just not real. Yeah. I mean, so what you're saying is that it was godless secular education that drove you away from the church sure yeah yep yeah that's what i hear okay uh so really the christians for private schooling are 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 kind of right on that front yep okay uh well let's bring in reagan and then we're gonna we're gonna discuss this kind of all together and we'll um we'll take some questions so reagan welcome to ask an atheist thank you so you're, you just finished college. Uh, did you have a similar experience where God, this godless, liberal, secular education just drove you right away from the church? Or was your, how did you become an atheist? I have a very similar story to PJ's, actually. Um, I grew up in kind of a blended household. My dad is Catholic and my mom is Methodist. So already from the get-go, I was pretty confused about religion you know, because they're competing ideas between the two of them. So I was thinking like, who is right? One of them has to be wrong, that type of thing. And I grew up in a predominantly white Christian small town. And so growing up, the cool thing was to go to church and be part of youth group and go to the Bible camp. And just like PJ said, like, I never got into it. I always hated it. I would have to be to go to church with like a meal afterwards (laughs) and was it, was it I mean, like I, something exciting for you as a kid? Was it like, we'll, we'll take you to get a Happy Meal at McDonald's or something like that? Correct, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very popular. Chinese right. buffets, I'm in, yes. And um, so I never really thought about religion a whole lot until I got a little bit older. And my sister was actually an atheist and she was secular and super into science. So I, was, I kind of already had that seed planted. Is your, but, sister, is your uh, sister older, Reagan? Yes, she is. She's six years older than me. Okay. Yep. And and so I was introduced to it that way. And then I started reading Christopher Hitchens in high school. Well, that'll do and it. And the rest of history will do it. I, I felt like the world was cold 
and I, it, it was kind of crazy because I was like a teenager and I was the angry atheist, like bashing the Bible on Facebook and I received a lot of backlash, a lot of backlash from family members, from the community, from just about everybody and I felt pretty alone. Um, I mean, that, that's really hard. And that is one of the things that we know happens to out atheists pretty regularly in this country uh, and online and in other countries, right? If, if you are out about criticizing the Bible or religion or Jesus or God, you open yourself up to a lot of vitriol. Uh, and this, is, this also holds true for people who stand up and challenge uh, violations of the separation of state and church. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I think it's so important that everybody who can come out as an atheist and, and proudly say that does it uh, because it lessens that stigma and it makes it easier for everybody else. So I'm really, I'm really glad to hear you say that. Um, and I'm wondering, is that, is that one of the things that kind of drove you towards uh, looking and finding out about the Secular Student Alliance and wanting to kind of build your own community? Yes, um, because the area that I grew up in was predominantly conservative, I was really excited to go to Minnesota State Mankato because I was just assuming this is going to be a more liberal state, a more liberal college. And when I showed up, I was angered once again because there were <laughs> plus religious organizations and nothing for secular people. And my mind was just blown that that was the case. So I reached out to one of my favorite atheists, Seth Andrews. Shout out to him because he started this whole thing. <laughs> For me, uh, yeah, we are big fans of Seth over here at FFRF. He, uh, he's been on this show a number of times and on Free Thought Matters a number of times. I've joined him. Yeah, he's, he's great. So, so you reached out to Seth. You knew, you knew him through his videos, I presume? Yes, I did. And I was never expecting an email back. And I remember exactly what he said was, you need to get hooked up with the Secular Student Alliance. They're aces at this stuff. <laughs> and I said, I how that is, but okay, I will try that. And I got um, I got in contact with Ryan Bell and Kevin Bowling. They're wonderful people, and they helped me start my own chapter. And um, so the summer after my first year of college, I ended up going to the Secular Student Alliance conference, and it was the first place where I really felt like my ideas were being recognized, and I felt accepted, and I was met. Uh, with nothing but kindness and support and camaraderie. So that was wonderful. And for people who are watching who are thinking, that sounds like something I would like to do, uh, secularstudents.org uh, is the website. Uh, we are huge fans of the Secular Student Alliance. Please go support their work. Uh, if you are a student looking to do what Reagan did and build up a community at your your, your school and then maybe move on into activism. You know, she's working at FFRF now. She's affiliated with American Atheist. It's a great way to really get involved in this community. Um, so secularstudents.org, go check them out. Uh, so after the, after the Secular Student Alliance convention that summer, Reagan, what happened? Well, at the convention, Allison Gill from American Atheist mm -hmm. presentation, and then I was introduced to kind of secularism in the legal world and the egregious policies that our country seems to come up with constantly and what you talk about in your book, uh, the totally untrue narrative of Christian nationalism, then I was introduced to all of that. And I originally wanted to be a lawyer anyway. And then with Allison's presentation, I just, that's when my love and my passion for having a legal career started. So. Yeah, and I, based on the work we've been able to do with you, I'm excited to see what you do with that. And you have a little bit of experience, PJ, with Secular Student Alliance, tangentially, kind of? Uh, through my daughter? Yeah, yeah. Can, yep. you, can you add that to the conversation? Sure. Uh, I was just thinking of that when Reagan was talking about that. So my daughter uh, attended the University of Wisconsin, which has a... Uh, uh, AHA program, American Humanist and Atheist. Is that Atheist, it? Humanist, Agnostic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so she was a member of that for four years, all four years of her college, and for two years she was vice president. Uh, you know, made made her dad proud. Yeah. 
Yeah, so. she invited me to come speak at that. Oh, uh, that's right. Group. Yep. Yeah, it's one of the stronger student groups that uh, also affiliated with Secular Student Alliance, um, and they they were able to get money from the university actually because of as Reagan mentioned, there's a lot of religious organizations at schools around the country, and they are often able to get money from the university to put on programming. Uh, and so here at the University of Ma uh, Wisconsin Madison, uh, the AHA was able to also get a big chunk of that money, and they've been able to put on some yep. big conventions in the past. Uh, really and fun. Uh, my daughter is now uh, heading off to uh, get her master's, and she was wondering if she could apply for one of the FFRF essay contests. <laughs> and you grade some of those, don't you? I, I do. <laughs> I said, well, I don't think that'll quite work since I'm the one that kind of makes those decisions. Yeah. We do try. We do try to anonymize all the grading, but it's that's still. <laughs> oh, this one's really, the, really good. The appearance of impropriety <laughs> there. Uh, so, and and Reagan, um, you're starting. You're starting law school in the fall. So you're going to be. You're going to be a rising one L. You're basically going to be learning a new language. Um, and then you're going to have three years of this, hopefully come back and work uh, with FFRF and some of the other orgs as a legal intern. And then, yeah. and then what do you want to do? Is this, is this what you want to do? What's the, if you had your dream job, what would it be? This is what I would want to do, for sure. Um, when I was in my philosophy of law class, the case actually happened to be American Legion versus American Humanist Association. And tell people, and real, real quick, tell people what that case is before, because uh, a lot of people don't know. So that was about the Blandsburg Cross case, a humongous case near a highway. Um, it was on, you know, public property, and Legion was suing the American Humanist, Humanist Association because they wanted it removed. Right? It was so long ago. I don't. Even yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. The American Humanist Association, forty foot tall cross, public land, like you said, said, hey, that's illegal. Take it down. Ended up as a lawsuit, and then that ended up before the Supreme Court. So th that's the case that you're you're talking about and working on then. Yes, and I kind of dove headfirst into that and listening to the oral argument and just kind of following Monica Miller who works for the American Humanist Association, following her journey to the Supreme Court, I saw her do that and I said, I want to do that someday for sure. So working for any organization like American Atheists, American Humanist, Humanist Association, FFRF, that is definitely what I want to do because I think it's so important. Uh, as we saw on January 6th, bring it back, we need to avoid those things from happening. And the way that I feel I can best do that is to fight for state church separation as an attorney. Well, I, I would I would agree with that wholeheartedly. <laughs> uh, so we're getting some questions coming in, and I do I do want to get to those. Um, but you know, is there anything else that either of you you know that I that I didn't ask you that you're that is missing from your story? I mean, Reagan. Sadly, we don't have a portrait of you um, at at the altar. Um, but you know, is there anything that that really is missing from the story of why you're an atheist? How you how you? Uh, this isn't really how or why I'm an atheist, but uh, kind of a fallout because I'm an atheist. So when I told my grandmother in high school that I didn't believe in God, mm -hmm. uh, she did not take it well. And she's a very educated woman for being in, you know, growing up, you know, in the you know, early 1900s and everything. Um, and so I thought I could tell her this, even though I knew she was religious, mm -hmm. um, but that it really it hit her hard, and apparently then she told some other people, relatives, and they kept coming up to me and trying to get me to yes. apologize to her or to renounce what I had said to her, and I just kept saying no. I was like, it's who I am, I'm yeah. not gonna apologize for that, you know. You shouldn't have to and, change who you are. And unfortunately, she I don't know if she lost respect for me or whatever, but it, unfortunately, it hurt her. And in hindsight, I probably never would have told her just mm -hmm. to save her the hurt. It is interesting though because it has nothing to do with her, right? Like your your personal belief system doesn't impact well, her. Well, to I mean, her, you know, as a grandson. I'm going to spend eternity in hell. Yeah, it, it upsets and, her in that regard. Yes. but it doesn't. It doesn't actually do anything to her. And I. And to me, that the the um, the fact that some people genuinely do get upset um, with the idea of their their friends and family burning in hell for all eternity, 
why worship a God like that is really indicative of a deep, true belief in this system. And when people are unwilling to try to save your soul in a way, I'm, I'm kind of like a little bit question whether or not they really do believe this stuff, you know? Like if you actually think that's gonna, that I'm going to burn in hell for all eternity, you really should be doing your best mm -hmm. to save my soul. Um, so I, 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 it's, it's a weird sort of backward yep, sympathy I get that. for me. Um, uh, Reagan, what about you? Any um, any issues with your family um, with coming out as an atheist? You said your older sister kind of paved the way a little bit for you, so maybe that made it easier. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to apologize to AJ that he has gone through the same thing. I am going through that currently with several of my family members, and that has been a long battle since I was 16 or 17 and I came out as an atheist. Um, and it's a story that's all too common. And it's it's just horrible that religion drives people who would normally have really wonderful, loving, supportive relationships to do to to act in that way. So that's pretty horrible. And and to yeah. anybody watching who might say, well, that's not very Christian, uh, I just remind you that Jesus said that he came to bring the sword. Uh, he came to divide families, to turn a father against his son, mother against her daughter, all that kind of stuff. This is what he envisioned: Christianity and. Belief belief in him as a deity is supreme over familial relationships. Um, again, why worship a god like that? So, we've got some questions coming in. I'm gonna, I've got them right here on my phone. Um, Neil, who does not appear to be very genuine, said, you can call yourselves whatever you like, but you're still a Satanist. Hmm. Religion isn't the problem, it's lost souls like you that is I believe he means that are the problem. Repent before it's too late. Uh, no, Neil, I, I shall not repent. Um, also, people who don't believe in God don't believe in Satan either. <laughs> I, mean, I know this is very difficult for some uh, believers to understand. We don't not believe in God, but believe in the devil, uh, or or that uh, it, it's you know we're just choosing this path because it's fun or easier. We get to go to the the satanic rituals right like we just we just don't believe yeah so i think what they think it's a lot of thinking there um <laughs> but you know we might not outward or think that we're satanists but we are because we reject jesus god whoever uh therefore satan has taken control of our brains or bodies or whatever and therefore we are Satanists even though we might not think of us ourselves as Satanists so that's what I think they think maybe but then how could we repent if we don't have control of our own actions Reagan thoughts I know a couple Satanists and they're some of the nicest people that yeah. I know <laughs> nicer than most of the Christians I know and isn't I uh, forgive me if I'm wrong but isn't the Church of Satan predicated on just anti-Christian values and anti-authoritarian. Isn't that the way it is? I don't even know if it necessarily... I'm, I'm, it yeah, I'm personally more familiar with the Satanic Temple and have quite a few friends there. And I will echo your sentiments. The, the, the members of the Satanic Temple that I know are just some of the loveliest people I have ever had the good fortune to meet. Um, and, and in stark contrast to, for instance... Uh, the Christians who were attacking the police officers uh, that we talked about at the beginning of this. Uh, so yeah, I, mean, I certainly agree with you on that one. But to play devil's advocate, uh, I think that you know this satanic temple and Satanism actually is like associated with humanism, but that's not what the Christians think of Satanism. They think of it as the Rosemary's Baby yeah. type Satan, where you know we worship. Yeah the devil and you know all of its hatred and everything yeah so I mean for, for my money a God that creates a place of eternal torture is is worse than any devil um, that he then puts there but I don't I don't know Neil if you want to if you want to at me go ahead and at me <laughs> okay we have uh, other other questions Caroline Al Carolyn excuse me Carolyn Allen asks I learned or says I learned a lot about ethics and caring from the church but non church goers often learn the same things somewhere maybe at home so I think this, this basically I think Carolyn's getting at the idea of like where do you if if you're not learning these values of our shared humanity in church, you know, wh where are you learning them? I 
personally, I just feel like you you just know them. It's almost uh, innate in humanity, mm -hmm. um, you know. And people, of course, the the God people will say, "Well, that's God putting that in you." Mm -hmm. It's like, well, then why do you need to learn that at church? <laughs> you know, if it's already in you, um, it's just you know, I. I have never wanted to purposely hurt anybody, you yeah. know. And I'm, al I'm always struck by that too, where people, you know, where you hear believers say something along the lines of, "Well, why don't you go around killing and raping and murdering?" And I, I have no desire to do that. Yes. I, there's nobody I want to kill or rape or murder. I would, I would never and do I like that. Penn really. Gillette's response to that, where um, somebody asked him that, and he's like, "Well, I do, I do rape all that I want, and <laughs> yeah. I do kill all yeah. that I want, which is none." Yeah, exactly. You know? Reagan, do you have uh, do you have thoughts on this? Where do you get your values if you're if you're not getting them from church? Sure. Um, I mean, I I was raised really well, but now that I'm an adult and I can rationally think through things and make my own decisions, for me, it is so much more empowering to do a good thing and be a good person, not because it's godly or it's going to get me into heaven, whatever that means, whatever that entails. It's just because. I genuinely want to be, and I think that's what other people are, people deserve. So it it's just like there's no excuse or no moral babysitter. I'm just doing it because I want to, and I I know that's the good thing to do. Yeah, so I, I, amen to that. Amen to that. That was that was well said. Uh, I, I enjoy that, and and I do believe too. It is there's a certain amount of um, to me arrogance that that comes through here from time to time, right? Like uh, if we think about the golden rule. Right. This, this, the golden rule is a simple rule that any child can understand and probably understands innately, as you were just saying, PJ. Right. It's, it's not something necessarily that you need to teach. Or if you teach it, can be taught in, in one, one sure. sitting. Right. Don't do something you wouldn't want done to you. And I think the idea um, that that is a Christian rule or a Christian principle or a Christian value is wrong. It is a universal human principle that every successful society we know of has come up with on its own. Uh, I mean, it's written down in Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics, I think 1,800 years uh, before Jesus was supposedly walking around, right? I mean, this, this, this isn't, these are universal, don't kill, don't steal. These are universal human principles that well, every we're, society We're pretty comes familiar up with. with how Christianity has plagiarized pretty much everything that it does, you know, so I don't. You know, that's not different. You know, they, they stole, you know, Saturnalia. Yeah. You know, I mean, and but what so. they're doing here to me is what they're doing. They're taking that Christian flag and they're staking it in to that universal human principle that belongs to all of us and mm -hmm. seeing, and then they're saying, see, look what we did. Look at how good our religion is, um, rather than recognizing it for what it is. Um, anyway, um, Kayla asks, what religion do you think is the hardest to leave? Ooh, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I wouldn't really know because I've only been associated with the Methodist and that was easy. I just never went. <laughs> I feel like Catholicism might be because they guilt you from day one and um, and I guess Scientology could be one that uh, and I guess the, the Mormons. Reagan, just, do, you have, do you have thoughts? I would have to say those more extreme versions of Christianity, for sure. Um, Catholicism and then being a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, especially. And I think the reason for that is just because the familial ties are kind of contingent on whether or not you're still a member of the church. And so if you leave the church, you leave your family, you're excommunicated, and that, that would make it difficult. Yeah, religions often create a lot of self-defense mechanisms and build them in. Shunning uh, is, a, is a great example which you were just talking about, you know, to, to keep people from leaving. Uh, and my answer to that is the religion that is hardest to leave is the one that you are in. Uh, I, you know, I, I stand in awe of the people who have the intellectual courage and honesty to look at beliefs that they have been told since... <laughs> they were children are absolutely true and you cannot question them. You have to take them on faith. And you have to have the, the courage and the intellectual honesty to go and then challenge and examine those beliefs despite every authority figure in your life telling you otherwise. Uh, to me, it just speaks volumes about the people who are willing to do that, including Reagan and PJ who are sitting here with me today. So I, I, I was fortunate enough, I didn't grow up in a very religious household. 
my my mom's operating principle was challenge everything. Oh, very nice. Um, so it was it was it, this was never an issue for for me. Um, and I really I often wonder if I had been forced to go every day till I was 18 or, or been bribed with with Happy Meals, would I have had that that intellectual courage and fortitude? And I don't know I don't know that I would. Um, but I, I like to think I would have. So and I, I don't know how I would be had I grown up in an environment like yours where I never had to deal with religion, like how would I think of religion now, you know? Yeah. So. I'm, well, and one thing my mom did, and, Re and Reagan, you kind of mentioned this at the beginning when you were talking about being raised in a split household. Um, my mom did encourage me to go to uh, Catholic mass with our Catholic friends. I remember going to temple with Jewish friends. Apparently after I went to my friend's uh, bar mitzvah, I came back and said I wanted to be Jewish because it was the most fun I'd ever had at a party. <laughs> Um, I, I, and I remember thinking, Reagan, exactly what you said earlier on, which is that this seeing all of these different truth claims alongside each other really brought home that they're not, none of them were true, right? Like they're, they're all making the same claim and they're all saying you have to believe it on in faith. And the obvious answer is, well, then none of you guys are, are true. Uh, and that was where I landed pretty early on too. So um, I'm gonna check and see if we have questions. I don't think we have any more questions. We do not have any more questions. So, uh, uh, Reagan, thank you. PJ, thank you for joining us. We really appreciated hearing from you. You're I think welcome. this was a this was a fun show uh, <laughs> to chat about, despite the uh, the rant at the top. Uh, I appreciate everybody who stuck through that. Uh, and please join us next week for the, another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist.